Daniel, welcome to my lounge. Uh, I'm going to be your therapist here. You can lie down here if you want. Uh, <laughs> um, Daniel, thanks for joining. I've, I've enjoyed our encounters in the past, but I want to start by going back to the origins, uh, if you will, of, of, of Kind Bar. As you were traveling, as I understand it, around the world, and you couldn't find a healthy bar or a snack that you liked, and you started this. And, and so I get that, and that you wanted to make something that was healthy. Where did this whole kind stuff come from? Um, so there's many ways to answer. Nice to be here with you guys, and thanks for coming. I think I, I'm kind of lucky that from a very early age, I learned what was my role in this world, and it's a little weird. And I only now can really say it this way, because I probably didn't know that consciously, but subconsciously, my father's a Holocaust survivor. He was uh, in a concentration camp in Dachau, and from an early age, he told us about what he went through and how it was our duty to prevent that from happening again. So throughout, you know, when you piece it back, the common thread and everything I've done is trying to build bridges with people to try to prevent what happened to my dad from happening again. So PeaceWorks, the first company I started, was about bringing neighbors in conflict regions together. The One Voice Movement, stuff that I did in college, in high school, in middle school, was all about, I think, from an existentialist fear, trying to bring people together. And when I had this idea for a healthy snack, that could do the kind thing for your body and for your taste, but I also wanted to do the kind thing for the world by building empathy and inspiring So you wanted to be people. selfish and selfless at the same time? I wanted to... I've always seen business uh, as a tool for making this world better. It's never been... I, I've always enjoyed business because my dad was an entrepreneur and I saw it and I enjoyed it and it was fun, but it's never been sincerely... Uh, just a tool to make money. I never, I, I don't mind it. I enjoy it a lot, and I think it's, it's, it's a very, very critical aspect of success is being able to be sustainable and scalable. I don't think you have the right to pursue a social mission as a business if your business doesn't have the right financial anchors. I think uh, there's too many mistakes also in assuming that we should hold business with a social purpose, with social, sort of a lower financial ambition or standard. I think it's dangerous because then the business won't be scalable and sustainable. And we're dealing with that issue right now. We have a venture in Jordan where we have Israelis working uh, in partnership with Jordanians, employing Syrian refugees. It's a beautiful project where they're working together, but the farm is not making money. And our objective there is not to make money because it's, it's never going to have the financial success that kind had. Our objective is to bring people together. But if we don't obsess about it being at its essence right. effective and run well, we're not going to be able to scale it. It's going to be then just a charity. And there's a lot of important things about charity. I also have nonprofits that have not developed an economic model where giving money every year to sustain it is important. But the cool thing about business is where you're able to channel market forces to do something good because market forces are sustainable, scalable, and it's, it's one of the greatest ways to impact our world. But it's tricky, it's hard, and, and, and for it to count, the business has to stand on its own. Daniel, what is the worst tasting kind bar you've produced in the past? <laughs> um, you would not have tried it because... No, I uh, think I did. <clears throat> Excuse me for one second. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this for a reason because, you know, one of the things, I mean, we, 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 we've known each other for a long time, but, but, but Daniel's experimented with a lot of different flavors, and we were talking about quality control, various but you're, sorts of issues. You're, but here's the issue I'm interested in is, is, is something that's deeper that has to do with this notion of purpose, this notion of doing great things, and whether companies use this to cover up stuff. I mean, I was going to be facetious and say, Daniel, you're so kind. You're, what are you covering up? But... but yeah. I, I'm interested, you know, in, in a serious way, whether, you know, you, you've had these challenges and whether there's this presumption that having this shtick of, of acts of kindness and kindness helps one get away with lower quality goods. Because I, I do see some firms out there doing that, and I'm just interested in how, how you look at that challenge so, and what your worst tasting bar was. Sorry, I'm turning this thing off. So, first, to address <laughs> quality. Um, 
you're getting confused about the story that I told you because the story this is where the PeaceWorks. I, that's PeaceWorks, yeah. yeah. When the first company I founded, uh, which Steve is, is, is teasing me about, is when I was just getting started and I was 25 when I started PeaceWorks, which is the company that brings neighbors in conflict regions to work together. And the uh, first venture was called Moshe Pupik and Ali Mishmunkan's world famous gourmet foods. Very, very different from kind, just four letter word. <laughs> and, uh, Moshe and Alice will affectionately call them. The first products we launched was a sun-dried tomato spread, an olive spread, and a basil pesto. And they were very high quality. That's how, after finishing law school, I tried this random product in an Israeli supermarket, and I loved it so much. And my research had been about how to use business to bring Israelis and Arabs together. And that became the conduit for us to try to turn theory into, into practice. And those products were good, but as we started expanding, my uh, buyers would say, we want more, try more flavors to fill up the shelves. And when I was about 26, 27, I got greedy and short-sighted, uh, and we started launching more flavors that did not have the same quality standards as the original. And the vein of my existence, and I keep a jar of that product in my office to remind myself, is uh, sweet and spicy teriyaki pepper spread, which why would <laughs> Arabs and Israelis be making an Asian sauce? I don't know. And the product was like gelatinous, and it was, it was really not. And in my heart, I knew that it wasn't at the standards of the other products. But I let myself believe that, okay, somebody tries it and they don't like it, they'll try something else. And it was a huge mistake because what I learned the hard way is that when somebody trusts you and a brand is all about trust, and then they trust you and then they try another of your product, and you disappoint them, then they won't buy it again. They won't just stop buying that one. They'll stop trusting your brand altogether because the brand conveys that. So we're very obsessive at kind from that lesson, and we will not launch anything that we don't think is going to exceed expectations. And, but to your broader question about where purpose can hide any quality issues or anything else, in my opinion, I actually do see efforts of companies to just patch on uh, purpose and I think it fails miserably because at the end of the day, and by the way, when I was doing PeaceWorks, because I was so passionate about the social mission, that's all I talked about, the social mission of PeaceWorks. And I didn't talk enough about the product features, and I wouldn't actually sell enough product. Everybody would say, oh, I want you to marry my daughter, you're such a sweet kid, but they wouldn't buy the product. And, <laughs> and I learned the hard way that, okay, to get married, I, I did realize, no, I'm just joking. No, I, but, I, uh, <laughs> but, but I had learned the hard way to focus on the product features. At Kind, for the first several years, we didn't even talk about our social mission. We did it behind the scenes, but we focused very much on, on taste and health. And I think it's a very, very big mistake to try to hide behind it, because it, it's actually kind of like a... Uh, in the earlier panel, they were talking about authenticity, and people that smell that, they're going to say that's not authentic yeah. and they're going to not just not, not it's not going to help you, it's actually going to hurt you because it's going to reek of manipulativeness. Or no, I am simultaneously addicted to the sea salt nut caramel bar and I try to be a better person when I eat one. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that, I mean, you, you, you know I joke about my cynicism and you're such a, you know, a good person, you're out there logging this, but you wrote a beautiful, um, incredible email to your team on November 9th, 2016. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, but you wrote, this seemingly endless election season culminating over the last several hours has been a painful journey of division, vitriol, and alienation for our country. It ends with America's citizens torn further apart than any time I can remember. Many of us are deeply shaken about the fate of our nation and our world. Global markets are signaling concern as we enter uncharted territory. There's a sense that the world's greatest democracy is more fragile than we realized and cannot be taken for granted, and on and on. And you're basically, and you tell your people, we need to be, stand by our values even more we need to be resilient in this, we need to do, and I'm just interested in how you think you're doing, because this does seem like a tense time in the country where there's a zero-sum competition between, you know, different groups in our society, and you're out there with a mission saying it can be different, and I'm, I, I, and I guess what I'm asking in a cynical way is, as you're trying to generate this kindness inside, are we the frogs cooking in the pot? In other words, is it, 
are we unable to kind of deal with the systemic issues as we're dealing with these micro moments of kindness? Talk me down, as Rachel Maddow would say. Well, I mean, I, I, it will take us hours to answer that question, but we have, uh, yeah. I wrote that at 4 a.m. in the morning, by the way, so I'm kind of like surprised that it makes any sense. Um, Best thing you've ever wrote and written. Thank you. Um, Look, I, when I started PeaceWorks and One Voice and all of these things, you know, I, I was born in Mexico City. I came to the United States when I was 16. My father was born in Riga, Latvia and raised in Lithuania, and he was liberated by American soldiers who risked their lives to rescue him from the Holocaust when he was age 16 and then came to Mexico. And so it, it's never lost on me a little bit of a sense of perspective. But I will say, having lived in the Middle East, in Mexico, I traveled all over the world, I really appreciate what we have here in this country. And it never crossed my mind that the work that we were doing in the Middle East to fight extremism and division and alienation would be so urgently necessary here in America. And, you know, I'm still committed and still investing time and energies and money, and, and we have some great momentum. I don't know if you saw what we, our Darkenu, the movement that I helped, a predecessor co founded did something incredible in Israel right now to bring people together and fight extremism. And so there's a lot of things that I've learned about the Middle East, about how to fight extremism that we're not gonna apply here. It never crossed my mind when I was on that journey 15 years ago that the stuff we were learning about how to fight sectarianism and division and totalitarianism and hatred. You could bring it here to the United States. We could bring States. here. And, but it's, it's terrifying because this is, this is like where everybody goes for the safety zone, right? Or for this, for like, and the fact that we are threatened I've been reading a lot, I don't want to overly dramatize this, but I've been reading a lot about how the Nazis rose to power. And in 1929, people thought they were a joke, they ignored them. And, and you know, within several years, they had amassed control of, of Germany. And I think we all need to recognize the seriousness of the times, and we all need to double down in our investment. I'm very impressed with how our founding fathers built this country with so much resilience that hatred has not prevailed. But it's certainly, this genie has gone out of the bottle. This crassness and bullying and disrespect has seeped into our culture. And what makes America so formidable is the strength of its courage and its kindness. Because kindness, people tend to associate it with weakness, right? But that's because they confuse being kind with being nice. You can be nice and be passive, but to be kind, you have to act. And you can be nice and just be an observer and just not do harm. But to kind, you have to do good. And so when you're nice, you're not bullying. But when you're kind, you stand up against the bullying. When you're nice, uh, you don't cause problems. When you right. can, you have the strength to fight against those problems. And what's, Amer what's amazing about America is that fundamental building block of kindness that has created the fabric and the resiliency of our country. And I think it's very, very important that we not lose it. It's very important that we don't allow manipulative uh, parties and politics, politicians or divisive forces to, to, to do that to us, and it's not, and, and by the way, social media being manipulated, whether it's by foreign countries or by others, there's a lot of things for us to be concerned about, like the danger that we all have to be listening to echo chambers. What I've, when you right. referenced that note that I wrote, what I've been noticing for the last year, and, and actually for the last several years because of my work also in the Middle East, is how difficult it is for all of us as human beings to accept information that is not consistent with our worldview. We tend to really like to absorb information to affirm our beliefs rather than to inform our beliefs. And the dangers that with the social media echo chambers and with all this manipulation and partisanship, that's only accelerating. And if you ask yourselves, it's not just people you know, in the red states or in the blue states, everybody has this problem. If you ask yourself, when was the last time that a fact that you read about actually made you change your mind about a fundamental issue? It's very hard for us to come up with those examples, and it's so imperative for us to teach both 
children and new generations, but also all of ourselves, to find a way to respect these agreements and to do it cordially, <clears throat> and to right. find a way to build, to, to see things from the other side. It's so amazing that you, 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 you can orate uh, this beautiful vision and that you also make snacks. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess I'm gonna ask you, and this is, this is, I told you I was gonna give you a great idea. I think you should do a special edition kind bar for the White House and Congress <laughs> uh, and, and, and see how that goes. Um, we have a project that's not completely the same, yeah. use, but maybe not as really? head on. Oh, good. I mean, I think, I mean, I think it'd be good. And I want to be there to, uh, when you release those, um, and I'll help. But, but, but in all seriousness, what I don't want to do, because it's the easy thing, and right. I, I need to tell you a quick story. Um, it needs uh, to be real brief. Okay. And it'll be, but it'll be sharing behind the scenes information. So uh, when... And uh, take a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you all. <laughs> when... Uh, my friends in Israel, the Darkeinu movement, were putting together a, in, in the Prime Minister of Israel, one of the greatest leaders, one of the few people uh, that I consider iconic and that I really look up to, besides my father, is the former Prime Minister Rabin. Mm. And he was assassinated by a crazy partisan person. So by the way, I want to listen to everybody, but I don't mean to say let's also consider violent criminals or violent thugs that kill a person on the same thing. So at some, some point you need to, uh, there's no moral equivalence uh, in Charlottesville and there's right. no moral equivalence in other situations. But this guy killed Prime Minister Rabin. And the Darkeinu movement in Israel, there's been a ton of division and politicians have used division to maintain control and power. And the Darkeinu movement decided that they wanted to send a message of unity. And the people on the left were very upset, not the people on the right, the people on the left were very upset because they felt, why are you building a tent and welcoming people that don't deserve to be in that square on the day that we commemorate uh, Itzhak Rabin because he was murdered for wanting peace and you guys are not talking enough about peace and about those values. And the Darkenu movement said, look, you know, this is a moment to unite everybody for our values of moderation against extremism. And yes, we support the two-state solution. And yes, we support, uh, we, we're against the assassination and the murder of Zacharin. But they were very respectful in the tone that they used. They didn't go poke against the politicians that, in my opinion, are causing so much harm. And when they were doing that, I was behind this and saying, guys, at some point, you need to fight back. At some point, right. you need to stand on principle. At some point, you can't have in this square people that shouldn't have the right. And uh, they did it their own way, and it worked amazingly. It really elevated the values. And I think what we need to do is not be partisan. It's like when one voice and there can you say, right. we're going to fight extremism, not extremists. Because the minute you say you are the problem, you're the extremist, then, and some of them are, some of them, if they're violent, yeah. they should be jailed or killed. And I'm sorry, I feel strongly that I'm okay with fighting violence with, with, with all the might that you need. But at the end of the day, you can't just take 50 or 30% of the population and say you're the enemy. You have to give them a way to join you based on values. So we have to transcend parties and politics. So if we were to do a kind bar, like you said, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be to poke you know, the White House or, or right. this, it would be to really stand on values and principles, say, let's all of us agree on this stuff. Thank you for that. There's so much more I want to talk to you about, um, Daniel. But we're not going to be able to do that today. I, I, I do want to ask you just, just uh, a yes, no, or worried question. Someday there'll be a, a kind bar where Daniel Blubetsky, the founder, is not the CEO, and you've moved on to do other things. Are you worried, I mean, just, just, are, are, are you worried, not worried? Ha, is what you've done with purpose and the kind of fundamentals of your business so ingrained, so intertwined, that you're not worried about your successor? You want it in one word? Yeah. Yes, no, or worried? I, I'm like the Mexican version of Woody Allen. I worry about everything. <laughs> <laughs> but. And with that, Daniel Lubetsky, founder and CEO of Kind Bar, Kind Snacks.